uh, opioid dependence versus addiction among work comp patients. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about myself first, so we know why we're talking about this right now. So I have the luxury to be trained as a medical provider and as a medical doctor in three uh, medical fields, uh, which kind of uh, encompass the whole question of pain and opioids and the treatment of pain from three very different perspectives, yet uh, it kind of ties everything together. So by training, I was trained in physical medicine and rehabilitation. Uh, physical medicine and rehabilitation, unfortunately, uh, has been substituted with the no uh, notion of pain management most recently, and especially on the West Coast. So there's a huge difference between physical medicine and rehabilitation doctors, physiatrists practicing on the East Coast and the West Coast. On the East Coast, nobody could go to proceed with uh, orthopedic surgery unless they came through me and uh, unless it was proven to the surgeon that everything non-surgical has been exhausted. Uh, this type of therapy, that type of therapy, whatever. And only then you would go to surgery. When I moved to the West Coast, the attitude was that the physical medicine rehabilitation doctor is just a pain management doctor, or what this means in the reality is a narcotic prescribing physician. Because no orthopedist, believe it or not, no primary care, believe it or not, nobody in their right mind wants to prescribe opioids, narcotics on a chronic basis for most of the people because there's some truth on why this is not indicated, why it's dangerous, why it's not necessary, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So therefore, people like myself, we found ourselves on the West Coast, and I'm in California, but um, so I'm just talking about my experience in California. We are essentially has been reduced to a narcotic prescribing doctors. Uh, now, Back in the days, uh, in the training, it was not enough just to be board certified in uh, physical medicine and rehab. Uh, when I did my training, it was a cool thing to go into pain medicine or pain management. I prefer the word pain medicine because medicine is actually gives you a chance to diagnose somebody to treat them. Pain management has been reduced to come in, pee in a cup. Uh, you have no other substances that I prescribed, more than I prescribed. Therefore, we're going to manage your pain. There is your script. See you next month. This is pain management. It's a horrendous term. I don't agree with it, so I like not to use it. But I've been called a pain management doctor for many, many years, and I hate that. Uh, so this is what it is. Pain medicine, it's a science of medicine we are, where we are specializing in uh, describing and treating different pain syndromes, right? And um, I ended up in addiction medicine for multiple reasons, but uh, an addiction medicine fell into my laps because a friend of mine died and there was nobody taking care of these patients. And because I knew so much because of, uh, about opioids, I was able to pick up the practice. And later it sparked my interest and I got boarded in addiction medicine. Um, so this is going to tie up uh, the opioid talk and the pain talk. Um, so what really happens to any uh, patient who enters into the work comp world in a work comp clinic. Most of the time, let's take a back pain, for instance. So patient comes in with a back injury. The doctor is going to say, okay, you have a back pain, therefore we're going to send you to some kind of a um, intervention, non-interventional uh, physician or a chiropractor for uh, very simple uh, appropriate uh, therapies such as maybe manipulation, physical medicine modalities, or physical therapy, actually exercise modalities. In the ideal world, this could be and should be um, very helpful for probably 80% of the patients. But because the world is not ideal in physical therapy in the workup world means uh, slightly uh, different uh, approach, usually it is not uh, sufficient. Why? Physical therapist is supposed to teach a patient exercise, it's supposed to teach what to do at home, supposed to make you feel better by teaching you what has to be done at home and you have to go home and do it on a daily basis. We as a consumers, including myself as a medical doctor who did not know anything about physical therapy initially, I thought that you go to physical therapy to get better. Well, that's not the case. You go to physical therapy to learn what to do at home, but we expect to go to physical therapy 
miraculously get better. So nobody does get better with 12, 12 sessions of therapy because um, 12 sessions, that's all you're going to get authorized for your uh, low back pain. You're not going to get more, you're not going to get less. So if in 12 sessions you can get better with physical therapy, they're going to send you to a uh, uh, possibly an interventional pain physician who is going to consider interventional injections. They're going to put needles next to your spine, put some lidocaine, put some steroids, and hope uh, that you will recover. But all that does, it just gives you a temporary relief. It does not fix the anatomy. It does not fix the issue. It does not fix the real problem. And therefore, most of these people are going to come back again to the doctor saying, I continue to have low back pain. Okay, so we just have to check off this list. What's next on the list? The next on the list is... Fine, we're going to send you to a surgeon. Let me see if a surgeon can do anything. 80%, 90% of the back pain, people do not need surgery. Therefore, they're going to go see a surgeon. Surgeon is going to say there is nothing to operate on. It's not a surgical lesion. They're going to come back to the doctor. What is the doctor going to say? Send them to pain management. Send them to pain medicine. Once they show up at the pain management door, the answer uh, was always give something for pain. Always. Now, now, I hope things are a little bit different, but before, that meant one thing and one thing only. Give them opioids, give them narcotics. You start with a small dose, then you escalate. Uh, you have to treat their pain. All of a sudden, your musculoskeletal patient, musculoskeletal problem patient with a knee pain, with an ankle pain, with a neck pain, with a back pain, with an elbow pain, became a chronic pain patient who is now requiring to be on opioids. That's what happens. So what's, what's missing in this picture? Well, most of the things which are missing is <clears throat> the pain medicine field was created initially to take care of the very, very severe advanced cases where absolutely nothing can make any difference. Uh, we uh, used to prescribe opioids only to patients with cancer, and then uh, we extended that privilege, and I'm going to call that privilege, to people who do not have cancer for non-cancerous musculoskeletal pain, and we decided that this is going to be the solution for everybody's pain. Well, I'll tell you what happened. But most of the time, these uh, particular individuals have never been evaluated by a specialist, like a physical medicine rehabilitation doctor who actually knows PMNR and not just a narcotic prescribing physician. Um, a lot of the time, they're missing the diagnosis. Not all of the workup has been completed. And... Um, these people, frankly, are not end-stage pain patients who are not going to benefit from other things besides the opioids. But in our medical practice, that's what we do. We just put them in the cards. Yeah. So you've mentioned in the last couple of slides, workers' compensation, work comp, and the typical diagnoses mm -hmm. and opioids. Is that specific to work comp, or is that across the board for all insurance? Uh, I think it's across the board for a lot of the insurances. Uh, because the medical system in this country has been reduced to uh, checking of the checkpoints. Uh, and if the patient continues to come back to you, despite multiple interventions which have been ordered or pursued, and they still say word pain, then by definition, a physician is going to say, well, if this is a chronic pain, you need to go see a pain doctor. Work comp is classic because in the work comp, uh, large practices back in the day in California, we would just go down the checklist. Okay, chiropractor, acupuncture, physical therapy, um, in injections, uh, uh, surgical opinion, narcotics. That's it, wrap up the whole deal, out of the door. Next patient, go through the same list. Same system exists pretty much across the musculoskeletal medicine. So, This talks about a little bit of a history of pain medicine. I'll tell you more about it later. But let's take a look at some facts. This is just some interesting facts. We in the United States have about 5% of the world's population, probably more by now. These are old statistics. In this country, we consume 95% of world's supply of hydrocodone, which is a Norco or Vicodin. We consume... 80% of the world's supply of oxycodone. I hope it's not the statistics anymore. These are uh, old. Uh, and uh, we consume 65% of the world's supply of hydromorphone. Okay, so this is just mind-blowing to me. 
And uh, what happens? We lose uh, more people to prescription opioids deaths than to car accidents in this country. Yearly in a Los Angeles uh, county where I practice, we lose 12 people a night to this problem. And uh, in the United States, one person dies every 20 minutes because of what we prescribe. This is what I used to prescribe, okay? Now I am a pain doctor. And uh, the workplace uh, injuries and insurance are spending about four billion per year on opioids. Four billion per year on opioids. <laughs> These are the stats. Okay, I did not make that. Uh, and is that because up. our government or FDA is a little bit more? Why is that? Yeah, we created the pain medicine to eliminate the suffering. It was a magic pill, which was supposed to solve all the problems. And uh, we being the most advanced country in a lot of, you know, things. And we like to think that our medical care is also very advanced. So we said, our citizens cannot be suffering from pain. If our citizen is suffering from pain, the doctor did not do their job and therefore it's a bad doctor. And we have to treat the pain like if we were treating a disease, and therefore, if we have the opportunity to medicate, we have to medicate. That's it actually came from a very, very good intentions. These are great intentions. Why not, right? Why not do this? But look what happened. So now, consumption of opioids in the world, right? So this is important. We consume per capita a tremendous amount of opioids. And uh, in the United States, we are clearly uh, you know, ahead of opioid consumption when compared to the rest of the world. Uh, so you would think that our crane, the chronic pain um, frequency or incidence would be much lower, but that's not the case. Actually, in the United States, we have more chronic pain than anywhere else in the world as well. So how come uh, we prescribe the medication to treat the problem, but the problem doesn't go anywhere? Uh, it doesn't make any sense, at least to me, right? So, well, work comp, uh, again, this was a lecture about workers' compensation, and uh, a lot of the uh, sales are going to be happening in the work comp offices, so this is very important for us to note. So, work comp insurance carriers are actually counting the money, they're counting the spending, they are not, uh, you know, they're, they're looking at outcomes and their importance. They want to know how much money they're spending and what kind of outcomes they're getting, because these are uh, eventually, you know, our money, our own money, taxpayers' money. Um, Interesting facts, again, if you don't put anybody on opioid in the work comp world, your uh, typical work comp place claim is going to be about $13,000. Let's take a look at the carpal tunnel. I think this is a carpal tunnel statistics. You have a carpal tunnel, you have a $13,000 claim per year. If you put that person on a short-acting opioid, which happens a lot or used to happen a lot, uh, that claim all of a sudden becomes uh, $40,000. And what happens to the work comp, uh, carpal tunnel claim? Same story as with the low back pain, because what? I came in, hi, I have carpal tunnel, great. Do therapy, great. Do this, great. Injection, great. Do that, okay, nothing helped, okay, go. Go to a surgeon, get it decompressed, great. Uh, after the decompression, you still have pain. All you have to do is say word pain, that's it, enough. Pain doctor. Pain doctor, what is pain doctor going to do for your carpal tunnel? They're not going to do anything else. They're not going to repeat the surgery. They're not going to repeat the injection. Everything has already been done, but just because you said word pain, we still have to treat. Therefore, what's in my arsenal? Pills, pain pills, pain pills. Now, uh, I gave you uh, four tablets of uh, Vicodin to take a day. Uh, then you develop tolerance. Now you require more. Then they taught me in a residency that now I have to uh, give long acting to cover for the base uh, pain uh, and then give the short acting for exacerbations of the pain, right? So therefore now I'm adding a long acting opioid. And guess what? My claim just became $120,000. $120,000, right? Very interesting. Again, we consume in the United States, and uh, please look at the trends, this is great. So we used to consume the most, we still consume the most, right? But at least it's trending down. So there's some good news here, right? Uh, 
Canada, our neighbor up north, consumes half of what we consume in the United States. France and Italy consumes half of uh, what they consume in Canada. Uh, guess people in Japan, what? They're not suffering with chronic back pain. They're not suffering with uh, carpal tunnel. They're not. No, they're working people, right? They're doing just the same things that we're doing. And how come they're not consuming anything? The, why, 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 why? Because they use other things, right? Because it's not in their culture to medicate themselves with opioids. It's not in their culture, but it is in our culture to say word pain is now associated with the fact that we have to take a pain pill. Uh, how we got there, I'll tell you about it. So, same slides, consumption of opioids. If we consume most, if we prescribe most of the opioids, you would expect, or I would expect, that in this country we do not have any chronic pain whatsoever because everybody is medicated, right? Mm -hmm. Everybody is medicated, nobody has any pain. Well, <clears throat> this, is, uh, this is chronic pain um, prevalence. Look at us, we're still red. I don't know where China is uh, uh, maroon and purple, I'm not sure, but uh, yeah, we're still red. So we prescribe the most, yet we still have the most pain. How, how, how does this work? Back pain, we were talking about back pain. Who has most of the back pain claims? Who has most of the chronic back pain? We do. How come? If we have most of the back pain and I give everybody the opioid to the pain pill to take, we shouldn't be having any back pain, but we do. Doesn't make any sense, right? No, doesn't make any sense to me. Oh, history, my favorite uh, uh, subject. So, 1980s, right? 1980s, uh, uh, there was a gentleman, I'm not going to mention names here, who put out an editorial. The, 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 thought, the thought was a good thought. It was a good, well-intended act. We said, okay, we are prescribing narcotics for people who are dying from cancer, and these people are doing better. They're not dying in pain. We're going to escalate those prescriptions to people who are dying from cancer because guess what? We don't really care what's going to happen to them later on because they're dying anyways and everything is off the limits. We make them comfortable. That was the idea. At any cost, I will give you anything, even if it's going to poison you. I'm still going to give it to you because guess what? The fact that you're suffering and you got, I don't know, so many months, so many even years or weeks. Who cares? Opioids, right? Makes sense. So uh, somebody brilliant had an idea. Well, people who have chronic back pain, okay? They're suffering. Why are they suffering? What, are we gonna discriminate people who have back pain versus cancer pain? So I have to have cancer to be pain-free? That's what you're saying, right? But that was the idea, right? So we said, right, let's give people with chronic back pain same medications that we give to cancer patients. Why are we going to discriminate? We're not going to discriminate because their pain is just as important. Your suffering from chronic back pain is just as important. And it is correct. Absolutely correct. I, I mean, I would have done the same thing. Well, we know how the history went. Uh, drug companies are not going to be named specifically, but some uh, manufacturers said, oh my God, this is great news. Yes, why not? We have the drugs. You, what you're proposing, doctor, is to, to expand the usage of our product from being prescribed only for cancer. Now we're going to prescribe it to everybody. Oh my God, how attractive, how fantastic. This was fantastic use. And we made sure that that particular company or companies or individuals put up a really uh, good effort and made uh, 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 very appropriate studies where they've showed that if you put somebody with a chronic back pain or chronic knee, knee pain on these medications responsibly, people are going to get better. They did. So they showed that uh, out of 100 people that they recruited, 99% got better. One person dropped out from the study. Well, not a big deal. They had constipation something. Um, so that's how it began. The whole pain medicine was born right there and then. And we said to ourselves, my God, what a beautiful feeling. Now we have a medication which is going to cure us all from pain. We don't need anything else. Insurance companies said, oh, this is even better. 
you want me to spend on one-on-one -on -one physical therapy, which is going to be costing me as an uh, insurer so much money, you want to, you know, why? I'm going to pay for the pill and they can take the pill. They're cheap, right? They're very, very cheap, actually, to make. Um, well, so the biggest mistake in science was the fact that it looked too good to be true. <laughs> and nobody raised any flags that it is just a little bit too good to be true. And it was too good to be true. Uh, now, in the retrospect, we know that we did not follow these patients for more than three months. So we said, okay, chronic pain, take narcotics for three months. And after that, we washed our hands and we said, great, everybody got better. Fantastic. Stop the study. No need to study anything else. Give the medications. That's perfect. That was the biggest mistake. Uh, so that was uh, late 80s, beginning of the 90s. Still work beautifully, right? Then people started noticing things, which are which I'm going to get to. Um, so this is today. Okay, not coming from me. Nothing, nothing in person. I'm not against opioids. I do still prescribe opioids. I'm not against opioids. I'm not here to bash opioids. I'm not here to say that uh, nobody should be on opioids. No, but this is NIH. National Institute of Health says uh, that chronic opioids are not supported for treatment of chronic pain. Why? I will tell you why. Uh, this is Veterans Affairs, safe and responsible use of opioids for chronic pain. What did, what did they say? Opioids are not the most effective treatment for long-term non-cancer pain. In fact, opioids are no longer recommended for the treatment of most patients with chronic pain. What did I just say? Oh my God, I just like ruined the whole medical specialty. The only specialty we have which is named after a symptom, right? <laughs> We don't have constipation medicine, do we? No. Do we have itchy medicine? We don't. Do we have, you know, but we have pain medicine, right? So, so we've created a bunch of professionals like myself. I went for 12 years into school. I learned, I learned, and they gave me the label. You're the pain management guy. You're so cool, the new sexy thing, you know, the new specialty that you're like full-fledged doctor, finally, great. And now what I'm saying to myself is that Everything that I've learned and everything what I've done is against National Institute of Health. Yes, yes. Oh my God, I'm so happy I did the addiction medicine fellowship after this. <laughs> you know, because it was tough to swallow. It was very, very tough to swallow that what I did for the whole time practicing not only helped, it didn't help, but it harmed, it killed, it destroyed. Uh, you know, thank God I can actually talk about it now, but back in the days, my God. <clears throat> okay, so let's talk about pain medicine, medication, and uh, addiction medicine. Um, okay, big question. So a lot of the time people are telling me, okay, if you are in chronic opioids, so it means that you're an opioid addict. No. No, you are opioid dependent. You're not opioid addicted. Can an opioid dependent be opioid addicted? Yes. Can an opioid addicted be opioid dependent? By definition, opioid addicted is opioid dependent. Uh, okay, uh, I went to medical school, right? <clears throat> how, many, how many months, how many times do they get lectures on addiction medicine? 2006, State University of New York, Downstate Medical Center, reputable institution, okay? My medical school, my alma mater. One hour. One hour in addiction medicine, okay? Uh, I took pain medicine boards. I took addiction medicine boards in addition to physical medicine rehabilitation boards. On my pain medicine boards, how many questions did I have in addiction medicine? Three. In my addiction medicine boards, how many questions did I have on pain medicine? About 20. Okay. So 
So what I'm trying to say is that the pain doctors, and I'm one of them, right? If I didn't do the addiction medicine, if I didn't learn the addiction medicine, I wouldn't have known what I'm talking about now. So I'm lucky, you know, I, I'm really, really, really lucky. But a lot of the people stop at the pain medicine, hey, double boarded, they put the shingle on the door, that's it, full-fledged, let's go. You know, they don't know because they were not taught, not their fault. They don't know, they didn't know. How would they? Nobody taught me. Uh, <clears throat> fact, 15% of general population will develop an addiction to something. It can be a psychoactive substance, alcohol, opioids, cocaine, stimulants, benzos, or it can be behavior. You know, gambling, um, excessive sexual behavior, you know, uh, excessive shopping, eating, by the way, excessive exercise, right? G uh, gaming and the cell phone. I mean, I have a bunch of those addictions, yeah. So 15% of people are predisposed. Is that why? Because the anatomy of the brain is such. It has nothing to do with anything. The anatomy of the brain cannot tolerate certain behaviors or certain substances. Not because uh, people who have addiction are bad people, they're losers, they're complete, you know, you know what I'm trying to say here. I'm not going to say it on that tape. No, it's just because the anatomy of the brain is such. Nobody's spared, right? These people are everywhere. They're all. Uh, another interesting fact. And what I'm going to say this and how I'm going to say this, um, I'll probably get a lot of hate mail and the phone calls. My, so don't, don't, don't give out my email <laughs> or, or my phone number. With opioids, are we treating pain? The most fundamental question of them all. Is an opioid a pain medication? Even if I'm asking this question, that it probably means that the answer is no. Whoa, this is like mind blowing, right? The whole country is being prescribed pain medications. They're even called pain medications. And I'm telling you that the pain medication does not treat pain. Yes, uh, this is that of the slides. Muscle relaxants. Is there a single muscle relaxant in our pharmacies which relaxes muscles? Not a single one. Whatever. Uh, yes, so <laughs> the point is opioids do not treat pain. Opioids treat pain perception. Okay. Uh, very, very interesting uh, semantic here. Opioids treat pain perception. Where do the opioids act? They act in the central nervous system. Uh, actually, chronic pain does reside in the central nervous system. So uh, there is more, the, the, the subject is more complicated, but for the simplicity's sake, you know, opioids, the receptors uh, to the opioids are only in the brain and in the spinal cord. So therefore, if the pain, the problem is in the foot, or a finger, we're not going to treat this. We're going to treat the perception. And how are we going to treat that perception? We're going to, we're going to anesthetize that people's perception of pain. We're going to make them numb to pain. We're not doing anything for their pain. The pain signal is still there. Everything, this pathway is still happening. Everything is still working. Is just we're so the chemistry of the central nervous system is so altered that we cannot make a good judgment about the level of that. That's what we're doing with the opioids. Um, you would ask me, so what are the pain medications? Well, actually, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories they treat pain. Tylenol, acetaminophen, the best pain medicine that we have. Uh, physical medicine modalities, and this is where uh, Zynex comes in, and this is where the, all the technology comes in. Physical modalities, they treat pain, they block the pain signal. They also stimulate same endorphins in the brain, which act by descending pain system in the brain. So we have ascending pain pathway and without descending pain pathway. There was a woman uh, whose arm got cut off 
bit off by a shark off the coast of Hawaii when she was surfing, a young woman. She's on YouTube, I forget her name. She tells you specifically in that YouTube video, she had no pain until she actually got to the hospital. Why didn't she have pain? Because the adrenaline was rushing and the descending pathway was so good, the working was revved up so well that she did not experience any pain. This is because of this. People, uh, people's, uh, we see this horrible, horrible scenes uh, in the movies. We see a lot of that stuff. People limbs get blown off and things like that. Do these people have acute pain later? Only later reason is because the brain is capable of fighting the pain. It becomes important uh, because it becomes important when uh, talking about real treatment of pain. Right? Now, <clears throat> everybody talks bad about opioids, right? Oh. They're bad drugs, they constipate you, they make you high, you abuse them, you get addicted, and you know, the worst thing is you can die from them. Yeah. Yeah, if you got hooked on them, truly. I mean, you're dying from it is the next door. I mean, now we have fentanyl, people trying to score, score some uh, Percocet off the street, you know. A pain doctor doesn't want to prescribe pain meds anymore because the urine was dirty for cocaine for one-time use. Oh, I'm not giving you nothing, writing you. Uh, not for any meds, they go, they are afraid of being in withdrawal state. So they go on the street, they buy stuff, what they buy, they buy fentanyl, they die. Yeah. So death arguably is one of the most uh, serious adverse and uh, extreme adverse uh, you know, uh, consequences of opioid use. But to me, to me, a guy who is dealing with uh, people who are complaining about pain, chronic pain, the most severe side effect of an opioid is actually pain itself. Again, what I'm about to say, a lot of people will probably disagree, but that's okay. You know, we're a free country, free speech. Last time I checked, I'm not sure about that anymore. Uh, opioid induced hyperalgesia, right? Anybody heard that? Opioid induced hyperalgesia. Now, as a pain doctor, I would fight. I would fight myself on this. My God, what are you talking about? Only 1% only, uh, of people develop that. No, no, negligible, negligible, no. The biggest problem with chronic opioid use, you're going to have more pain. Why? Science. Um, a little bit complicated, but imagine that. You only had, let's say for, for instance sake, you only had 100 opioid receptors in the central nervous system, right? And now you develop pain. We have these receptors in our brains. Why? Because we make our own opioids. Indigenous opioids, they're called uh, endorphins, encephalucans, and other things. So, we are making opioids, narcotics within our own brains every single day. And we occupy some of these receptors. And by stimulating these receptors, we make ourselves feel good. So now I'm going to introduce an opioid from outside and have that opioid occupy, I don't know, 30% of those receptors, 30 out of 100 receptors. So initially, it's fantastic. You don't feel anything. You're completely in a good place. You are totally taken care of. Pain is taken care of. Everything is good. Well, what happens? It's a dynamic process. Every time you introduce something to the central nervous system, to the brain, the brain tries to fight it. You poison it with alcohol, brain tries to fight it. You poison it with heavy metals, brain tries to fight it. You poison it with uh, whatever you want to poison it with, brain tries to fight it, reestablish the equilibrium. So what happens every time if I continue to give that opioid from outside to the person, your brain finally says, whoa, you know, I'm getting a lot of opioid from outside. Number one, I'm not going to make my own opioid no more. What for? I'm not going to spend energy making my own opioid. And it shuts down this pathway right here, shuts it down. And it says, hey, why expend the energy if I don't have to do this? That's how humans uh, exist. We, our job, number one, is to spend as little of energy as possible, right? It's a survival effect. Every animal has it. So we shut down that response. Later, what happens is that the brain says, well, you know what? The 30% of those receptors are already occupied, and they're constantly being occupied. That's not equilibrium for me. I'm going to kill off these receptors. I don't need them. That's garbage. And it kills them off. 
So now we have 70. So now I come to the doctor, doc, but you know, uh, my four Percocets now are not cutting the pain relief that I was looking for. What is doctor going to do? Check up the dose. So now you can overwhelm the system. The doctor is basically now saying, no brain, I'm going to fight you back. I'm going to give you more opioids so you feel the same pain. And what is the brain going to do? Oh, it's going to fight right back. And then eventually what happens? Now you only have, let's say, 50 out of those 100 receptors. So now what? Now, believe it or not, what you have just uh, done, you lowered the pain threshold equilibrium. So whatever was semi-uncomfortable before, now it's going to be, frankly, painful. That's how the brain operates. It is very simplified version of what I'm trying to say, but the opioid-induced hyperalgesia is the, one of the most horrendous side effects of the chronic opioid, because now you cannot fight pain on your own. The pain generalizes. What is the uh, hallmark of opioid-induced hyperalgesia? You started with the back pain. Well, now you have neck pain. Now the muscles ache. Now this hurt, that hurt. That's the opioid-induced hyperalgesia. So because you lowered your pain, tolerability, you've got no tolerability left. So that's opioid-induced hyperalgesia. Again, not me. I'm, you know, that's not our, I didn't write the book. NIH uh, wrote the book. There is a mounting evidence that long-term opioid use for pain can actually produce a chronic pain state. So science is there, everything is there. Doctors are not reading it. I don't know why they're not reading it or they don't care, I don't know. Uh, this is American College of Occupational and Environmental Medicine guidelines, very important guidelines. Oh, show me the guidelines. I'll show you the guidelines. These are the guidelines. Uh, this is California Medical Treatment Utilization Schedule, which mimics the official disability guidelines, ODG guidelines, ACOIN guidelines, MQS guidelines. Uh, whoa, doctor, you, what do the guidelines say? They say that, this is a quote, quote, I copied and pasted. Opioid use is moderately not recommended for treatment of subacute and chronic non-malignant pain. Not recommended. Okay, guidelines are saying so. I'm not going to argue with the guidelines. I didn't write the book. I didn't write the guidelines. This is occupational medicine. This is American College of Occupational and Environmental Medicine guidelines. I'm, I'm sorry, this is an old edition. But even in 2004, we knew that narcotic medications are the most important impediment to recovery from chronic pain. Uh, studies patients who receive narcotics for chronic pain are less likely to recover function and are less likely to go back to work. Statistically, if I put anybody on an opioid from work comp world, uh, I hurt my back at work, uh, doctor, I did my physical therapy, I did injections, I did surgeon said no surgery, give me an opioid, I am now taking narcotic, what's the chances I'm going back to work? Zero. Done. Done, 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 done. Nobody's going to work. <clears throat> Definitions. Okay. Tolerance. You need more and more and more and more medication to achieve the same effect because your brain is fighting back. You poison it with an opioid, it fights back. You need more opioid to achieve the same effect. Dependence. Uh, important. If I take out the opioid immediately, person goes into withdrawals, physical withdrawals. Why? <clears throat> so, Let's take uh, which drugs give us uh, withdrawals. Uh, they're going to be opioids, benzodiazepines, alcohol. Uh, these are the drugs which are responsible for uh, withdrawals. So if I am, uh, let's say for in the case of alcohol, I'll just keep talking. In the case of alcohol, if I am stimulating a, a GABA receptor, it's a, it's, it's a balance, right? Uh, if I'm stimulating GABA, you're going to make glutamate to fight back. If I'm giving you opioid, the brain counteracts and makes something else. So now I remove, thank you, Lisa. So I remove the opioid, but the brain was fighting that opioid with another chemical inside for so long. Now it's going to give me effects of that chemical. So in other words, it's, it's always a balance. If I load up the brain with uh, one substance, the brain has to make something else to counter at the balance. Now imagine I remove the substance from here, boom, the scale tips, bang, 
withdrawals, horrible, horrible, horrible. So uh, that is the definition of uh, dependence. Addiction, not the same as dependence. If you're dependent, you not, may not necessarily be addicted. So addiction, the definition is a despite a negative consequence to the behavior, which is either a substance use, in this case would be abuse, misuse, or a behavioral engagement in a gambling or you know, excessive shopping or whatnot, excessive eating. Despite negative consequences which happen because of the engagement in that uh, activity, you still continue to use, that's an addiction. I'm drinking half a bottle of vodka a day. Doctor said, listen to me, you're an idiot, your liver is cirrhotic. Whatever, I keep drinking, addiction. I'm using opioids, I'm, I can't function for half of the day, I don't remember what I said half an hour ago, uh, I lost my job, I was working for a wonderful company, and I lost my job, and my wife said, screw you, you know, you don't have any income, I'm going to walk. You continue to engage in consuming that opioid, despite the fact that you lost your wife, addiction. Uh, health, financial, legal, um, you know, methamphetamine, you get so high that you don't know what's happening. You went and you want the drug so bad, you went and you robbed the store, you got arrested. Despite that, you continue to go back into the same behavior addiction, right? So it's not the amount, it's not the duration, it's the negative consequences. A slap on the wrist doesn't work for you. Bigger consequences don't work for you. This is an addiction. So those are the patients that are going to be coming in early. They're going to come and they're going to have multiple substances in their urine samples. They're going to have other um, exhibiting other behaviors and et cetera. So, but I guess we're not really talking about uh, uh, dependence versus addiction. We're going to skip that. Uh, the good news, the good news is the opiate consumption is reducing. I'm not going to go through these slides. In the United States, we're lucky. We are lucky because we are making a difference in reducing opioid prescription, in reducing opioid consumption. And I'm just going to say this because I think this is for our internal use. And the Zynex is making a huge difference. Why? Because we are contributing to the decrease of this nonsense that I was keep talking about. Why? Because we have something else which can treat pain. Yeah, very simple. We have something which is effective. It can be used. It should be used. The problem, this is what we are up against, and this is for you to also to know. You have to understand, once anybody tries an opioid for their pain relief, there is never going to be anything better than that. What did I just tell you? Opioid does not treat pain. What does treat pain? Let's forget about the next wave. Acetaminophen, Tylenol, treats pain. Who do you think, how many people are going to sign up to quit an opioid for acetaminophen? Nobody. Who is going to quit taking uh, tramadol, which is an opioid, or a Vicodin in favor of taking ibuprofen? The most brilliant pain medicine is ibuprofen, is acetaminophen. These are real pain medications. They treat pain. They don't treat the perception. They treat real pain. But who is going to sign up for ibuprofen after taking an opioid? Who is going to sign up to do anything after being treated with an opioid? Oh, nobody. <clears throat> so the, 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 the big question is, once you started somebody on an opioid, the train is gone. It departed. So a lot of the time we come in and it's too late because they have experienced already. Opioid does not just mask pain. Opioid is an amazing uh, medication to treat um, emotional pain. It is an amazing medication to treat anxiety. It is an amazing medication to treat depression. And uh, unfortunately, like any other medications which are so effective over time, give it chronic use, it will turn itself exactly against you or against what it was trying to accomplish. Alcohol, it's an amazing drug. People self-medicate for multiple reasons. You don't want to ask this girl out uh, to dance with you? Well, guess what? You go, go have a shot of tequila, okay? You have a social anxiety, 
You know, you 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 don't want to. I have I have friends who auditioned to play cello for the national orchestra. They had to drink not to be nervous. Once they had so much to drink, they forgot what they had to play. Right. So, but eventually, alcohol it will flip from being medicinal into the worst enemy. Benzodiazepines, anxiety medications, absolutely wonderful medications. It's an alcohol in a pill form, uh, activates the same receptor. But that does not mean that the wonderful medicine should be used chronically or can be used chronically because chronic benzodiazepine use or anxiolytic use will give you the same thing. It's not going to treat anxiety, it's going to give you more anxiety. Chronic uh, opioid is a marvelous medication. But the chronic use, what is it going to do? It's going to give you more pain, not less pain. Opioid, because of the psychiatric circuitry of the brain, uh, because of the reward uh, circuitry of the brain, will treat emotional pain, uh, depression, uh, will numb up any kind of PTSD experience, post-traumatic stress disorder. It's a great medicine. If used correctly, very, 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 very cautiously, Right, what we have done, we said, oh my God, yeah, just use it, keep using it. It's like telling an alcoholic, you know, oh yeah, you know, you liked that dance with the girl after one shot of tequila, why don't you have a shot of tequila four times a day? See how you function. Well, we know how we're going to function. You know, we know what's going to happen. So same thing keeps happening. So opioids belong to the same class of drugs, which are great. But we are misusing them, we're abusing them, we're using them completely wrongly, right? So... The biggest question becomes, you walk into the office and you're trying to sell them a, a Tylenol for somebody who has been in an opioid. Huh. You know, but there is a room, there is a room. Because guess what, who I see in the, in the clinic? I see the patients who have gone through chronic opioid use. And not only they've gotten better, they've gotten worse. They can't function, they can't even walk the dog anymore. Forget about, uh, you know, fixing the garage. Forget about doing anything. They're just sitting on the couch and they're consumed by the pain and they have a medicine. I had a guy who is coming in with me on an intrathecal uh, dilated pump with oral methadone and the fentanyl patch with the father and the patient is a nurse and they were exhibiting pain behavior and the father was screaming, make sure the doctor sees it, make sure the doctor sees it. So you can only imagine what, what happens to the heart. So there is a room and the power is, the knowledge is the power. So the, the power in this particular case is not saying that, well, you know, you're just dependent, you're just an addict, you know, this is not the treatment. No, the power is to understand why this is the completely wrong approach. And uh, you can actually make a huge difference in these people's lives because if and only if you can win them off and give them something else. Okay, in our case, you know, we know what we're talking about here is the, is the, is the devices, right? But look, if we can get you off the Oxycontin into acetaminophen, uh, back in the days, I thought it, it's impossible. But now that I'm actually practicing it every day, because people come, they don't know what else to do. They're coming, they're saying, please help me. I'm on narcotics and I'm dying. And 80% of the time, if I can only convince them, if I can only convince them, it's possible, it takes time, it takes uh, persistence, education. And if you, because of, what is the patient thinking? What's the biggest problem? You came to the doctor and doctor is telling me to get off my pain meds. You are telling me to get off my pain meds. I've seen 10 doctors before you. Everybody keep increasing the dose. Everybody told me this is the right thing to do. Who the, are you to tell me to get off my pain meds? They're my pain meds. You're not taking them away. Well, you can spin it differently. You can say, well, ma'am, sir, you came here and you need help. And you're asking me for help. And look, despite the fact that the whole United States is consuming opioids, 95% uh, of the world's possible, world's, uh, you know, supply of hydrocodone, we still have more chronic pain. There's a reason for that. Because these people, they are truly, truly in trouble. 
because what has been installed into their brains by the medical doctor, by the medical system, by our society, by everybody, it is very hard to break. But there will be people who will listen. There will be people who are, who, they have nothing to lose. When they come to me, they really have nothing to lose. They're like, okay, it's like an alcoholic giving up power to the, to the, oh, I'm done. I lost control over it. That's it. That's, that's, so there is an opportunity. And only if uh, uh, armed with the knowledge, and I hope I gave enough basic knowledge, and I can dissect every single point of the, of the conversation we had. I hope I gave enough uh, power to persuade prescribers not to even embark on the situation, not to even consider it. And yes, chronic pain is a difficult conversation. Pain in general is a multi-model. It's not just a physical aspect. We talked about emotions. We talked about all these things, but you have the tool in your hands that has to be used, right? It's been used by hundreds of years. And just because uh, some uh, Medicare doesn't have the code for it, doesn't mean that we can't use it, right? We'll find a way to use it. One way or another, I'll, I'll think that. <laughs> but the argument is that uh, what we're doing is maybe not the best thing, and there are better ways of uh, doing it. So, on that note, with your permission, I'll stop.